Thank you, Governor Beasley. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here uh, in your home, in the people's home. Susie, thank you uh, for the invitation. And Cheryl, it's so nice after 18 miserable years <laughs> to, to spend uh, more time at home, and not just at home, but traveling around with my wife. To be able to do that has been a wonderful thing for the past year. And Gordon and Bakaiwan, it's so wonderful to be here. Uh, we in the Flake family uh, have always uh, been jealous of the, the smart Flake, as we call him. <laughs> we have followed him throughout his career. The smartest move he made, certainly, is marrying Pakaiwan. And they have a wonderful family. It's great to be here visiting them. And I'm sorry it took us so long. We just didn't know he was going to stay that long. And now, six years later, I think we could have waited 20 years and we'd, he'd still be here. So uh, we're grateful for that, and you're all blessed that he is here. Um, Gordon's uh, origins and mine are in the small town of Snowflake, Arizona. I'm not kidding here. <laughs> Snowflake, Arizona was founded by our great-great-grandfather, William Jordan Flake. A man named Erastus Snow came along, and they combined the names, Snowflake. It does snow there, it is a high elevation, but the name is the, the combination of the two names. Now, there were so many in town that shared our surname that we grew up not knowing that flake was a funny term. Nobody made fun of us in Snowflake. <laughs> but uh, soon after leaving town, uh, Cheryl and I moved to Washington, D.C., and we were at a reception. And there weren't any name tags, but a gentleman that I was talking to, it came up in conversation that I was from Snowflake, but he didn't know my name was Flake. And it turned out, I don't know how, he knew somebody from Snowflake, and he just couldn't remember the name. So he struggled for, <laughs> for several minutes at uh, remembering the name, so I thought I would narrow it down for him, since a good number in town are named Flake. I said, was this guy a Flake? <laughs> he said, no, nah, he seemed pretty normal to me. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time I asked. <laughs> In choosing a career, I, I considered where I could be comfortable among flakes again, and Congress was a pretty good option, I guess. <laughs> so, but in any event, I was raised on a cattle ranch in Snowflake, the fifth of 11 children. I have 69 first cousins on my father's side alone. I know what you're thinking. That is how I got elected. <laughs> it can't hurt, I can tell you that. But I spent uh, 12 years in the House of Representatives and six years in the United States Senate. During that time, obviously, serving with the great Senator John McCain, I was simply referred to as the other senator from Arizona. <laughs> But it was a, a moniker I, I grew to love, and I enjoyed serving, obviously, and working with uh, my mentor, John McCain. But it did have its drawbacks occasionally. I remember one flight uh, I took, or well, we took the flight every week from Washington back to Arizona. So John and I boarded the flight. He was sitting somewhere 13D. I was back at 17F or something. And I sat down to, next to a woman who was very excited. And I thought, well, she must recognize me. And, <laughs> and uh, I sat down by her. She said, hey, John McCain is on the flight. She said, <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, he's over in 13 D or whatever. She said, have you ever flown with him before? <laughs> I said, once or twice. <laughs> Still nothing. <laughs> and then she said, do you fly to Washington often? I said, about as often as John McCain. Still nothing. <laughs> then she asked if I was a golfer. It was the U.S. Open. <laughs> it was the uh, Phoenix Open that week in Arizona, and uh, I said, thanks, but no. Um, finally, the gentleman sitting in front of us leaned back and he said, hey, lady, he's the other senator from Arizona. <laughs> so, uh, I did get used to that. My only regret in addressing you today is that there is not much happening in Washington or in the world to talk about. 
But my, my real message is today, bear with us. Bear with us. We will get through this, and we will be the stronger for it. I'm sure that the discussion after I speak, uh, we will address Senate impeachment process that will begin next week, its impact on this year's elections. I'm sure we'll talk about the U.S. foreign policy and the alliance between our two countries, the very strong and productive alliance. So I thought I'd say a few words about an issue that is uh, universal in politics, unfortunately, a global phenomenon today. It's an issue that prevents us from addressing the serious challenges that each of our, our countries face. That is the growing tendency to see our political opponents as enemies. In Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address, he referenced the better angels of our nature. I've always loved the prose and poetry of Abraham Lincoln's speeches. The earnest supplication to heed the better angels of our nature came at that time when our nation was at war with itself. We gratefully have no calamitous conflict today, but perhaps at no time since the war between the states has our nation seemed so divided. In Washington, at least, where we talk endlessly of red states and blue states, as if they were competing armies, it seems that the better angels of our nature have been sidelined for good. Now, given the leadership role that the U.S. has traditionally played in the world, this political vitriol seems now to be our chief export. In today's environment, whether you live in London or in Washington or in Phoenix or in Perth, it's difficult to turn on the television or radio or look at newspapers or social media without being alarmed by the contempt and the cruelty that accompanies nearly every discussion of politics. At least I hope we are still alarmed. I hope that we haven't accepted as normal the current state of politics, but I fear that that acceptance comes closer by the day. We might ask ourselves, how has it come to this? How far have we gone? Let me give you a couple of examples from my time in office. In January 2011, a few days after my Democratic colleague, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, was shot and gravely wounded while greeting constituents at a Tucson supermarket parking lot, uh, we in the Arizona congressional delegation left an empty seat for Gabby at that year's State of the Union address in Washington. We made a point to sit together in solidarity rather than divide along party lines as the rest of the chamber typically does during that speech. One year later, Gabby, who was still working to rehabilitate from her grievous injury, returned to Congress. I sat next to her on the Democratic side of the House chamber during the President's address. During uh, President Obama's applause lines, she wanted to stand up with the rest of her colleagues and applaud, but she was unable to do so on her own, so I helped her up. That left me, a lone Republican, <laughs> standing among a sea of Democrats. <laughs> I immediately started receiving furious text messages and emails from partisans who wanted to know why I was standing. Why did I agree with President Obama? They didn't see what was meant as a humane gesture. They saw someone consorting with the enemy. Much the same happened during the 2016 presidential campaign when Senator Tim Kaine was named as Senator Clinton's running mate, or Secretary Clinton's running mate. Tim and I had entered the Senate together. We often differed on policy but I knew him to be hard, uh, smart and hardworking and patriotic. I knew that Tim's son, Nat, was serving as a Marine. By way of congratulating Tim on being named to the ticket, I tweeted a playful jab, trying to count the ways I hate Tim Kaine, but I'm drawing a blank. He's a good man and a good friend. Congratulations. Once again, unhinged, irrational fury 
from some on my side of the aisle. At a political gathering that week in Arizona, I received a scolding from a diehard Republican who said that I was aiding and abetting the enemy. If you can't say anything bad, don't say anything. He stopped himself <laughs> before reversing the advice I'm sure <clears throat> his mother gave him his whole life. <laughs> but such is the conditioned response of a shattered politics. Then on a beautiful spring morning, or June morning, nearly two and a half years ago, I was standing between home plate and first base on a baseball field in Alexandria, Virginia. I'd already fielded balls in center field and had taken my swings at the plate in batting practice a few minutes earlier. I was now waiting for the last of my Republican colleagues to finish so we could go back to the more mundane job of legislating on Capitol Hill. And then a shot rang out. We couldn't understand what it was. Confused, not knowing exactly where it came from, we looked at each other for a few seconds until another volley rang out, accompanied by our third baseman yelling, shooter, shooter. The next 10 minutes were an intense blur as the gunman fired nearly 100 rounds at members of Congress and staff on the field. I remember turning and running and diving into the dugout, laying as flat as I could, and then fashioning a belt as a tourniquet to put on the, the leg of a staff member who had been shot while the gunfire raged above and around us. When the shooting stopped, I ran out to the field and used my batting glove to plug the bullet hole entry into Steve Scalise's left hip, looking for the entry or exit wound and not finding it. We held that batting glove there until first responders arrived. I then used Steve's phone to call his wife so she wouldn't learn that her husband had been shot. But the most enduring memory I have of that day came as I turned toward the first volley of gunfire and ran toward the dugout, watching bullets as they pitched in the gravel in front of me. I remember thinking to myself as I stood, as it seemed that time stood still for a long time, I remember thinking, why us? Why us? How could somebody look out at a bunch of middle-aged men playing baseball and see the enemy? The gunman who died during the incident uh, had surely been stirred up to anger by the polemics of social media and cable news. Among his belongings was found a piece of paper where he listed a bunch of Republican targets. A few months ago, two individuals who made death threats against Cheryl and me were sentenced. One of these men, the same person who spent, uh, sent pipe bombs to several Democratic legislators and media personalities, tweeted an aerial photo of our home in Arizona with the caption reading, Senator Flake, there are a lot of entrances. I'll see you soon. Fortunately, he was caught. Another individual who's not yet been apprehended sent text messages to Cheryl with links to beheading videos. Included with these texts were the addresses of each of our children. The level of hate and vitriol that many Democrats feel for Republicans and Republicans feel for Democrats is unhealthy not for just the Republicans and Democrats that harbor those feelings, but for the country as a whole and by extension by the world that watches. In this political climate, elected officials have little incentive to deliberate, let alone work together for the common good. Every political instinct a politician possesses in this type of environment encourages him or her to reach, to rush to the safety of the tribe, to state their position and stay there. To even suggest for a moment that a hearing you might be chairing might inform your vote is to invite criticism from all sides. To admit that you have an open mind with an investigation that is occurring might have you trending on Twitter, not in a good way, or it might guarantee that you have a primary opponent in your next election. In this political climate, politicians make a calculation 
Do I want to anger one or both sides? If I show no sign of willingness to consider evidence or listen to testimony, even the opposing side won't be that angry because they would never think that I was persuadable. This is largely where we find ourselves in the United States today. In this political climate, there is little currency for thoughtful deliberation, for cooperation, or thoughtful negotiation. Now, as I see it, about the only real alternative we have to getting along is to be alone, completely alone. Let me tell you, I've tested that alternative, and it's no picnic. Several years ago, I clicked on Google Earth, located a bunch of small uninhabited islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Determined to live out a strange dream I've had since my childhood, growing up on a dry, dusty ranch. And after reading countless books about sailing adventures gone bad, I decided to maroon myself on one of these, myself on one of these Pacific islands just to see if I could survive. I remember talking to Cheryl about it. She had heard me talking about this dream I'd had our whole marriage. Finally, 10 years ago, she said, if this is your midlife crisis, get it over with. Maroon yourself already. <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> I picked an island, and the marshals got permission, flew to Hawaii, then to Majuro, then to Kwanjalein, and then had a fishing boat drop me off on an uninhabited island with no food or water and just a few essentials to try to collect them. Just to give you an idea of how alone I was, after a few days on the island, I picked up one of the hermit crabs that wandered through my camp endlessly. I wanted to know if it was the same one doing laps or if they were reoccurring. <laughs> so with a Sharpie pen that inexplicably made it into my meager survival kit, I picked it up and wrote number one on his shell and put him down. A while later, I picked up the next one and wrote number two on a shell and put him down. By the end of the week, I had 126 numbered friends. <laughs> I still miss number 72. <laughs> number 42, not so much. He pinched my toe. <laughs> it's been said that no man is an island. That I can confirm. It was a long, hungry week. But when I find it difficult to be civil or decent to, tho to those with whom I associate or with those with whom I disagree, and when I am inclined to ignore the betters, better angels of my nature, I think back on the lonely alternative. There is no joy in being alone. So in a bipartisan gesture just a few years ago during a congressional break, uh, New, York, uh, New Mexico uh, Senator Martin Heinrich and I decided that uh, we would go back to the Marshall Islands and see if we could survive with just a, f a few survival tools. We wanted to prove that Republicans and Democrats could get along. <laughs> kind of an extreme way to prove it, I know. <laughs> we did survive after a week. Discovery Channel actually came along to film the adventure. They call it Rival Survival. <laughs> you can buy it for $2.99 on Amazon still. <laughs> we had just a machete between us. Not the smartest move in this political environment, I know. But we made it. And upon return to civilization, we went around and did a lot of interviews, and talked about the experience. Late night comic uh, Stephen Colbert, I think, had the best response. He ran clips of us surviving on that island and then said, Flake and Heinrich proved once and for all that Republicans and Democrats can get along if death is the only option. <laughs> <laughs> so for what it's worth, it's been proven empirically. But the temptation to return verbal fire after being publicly insulted is sometimes overwhelming. Early last year, a newly elected Democrat to the House of Representatives uh, publicly used very vulgar language calling for the president to be impeached. Since I had been very critical of the president's use of similar language over the past two years, I tweeted the following, quote, there should be no place in politics for language like this. 
Pointing out that the President also speaks crudely is no excuse. We can do better. Over the next two days, more than 30,000 people commented on the post. Not retweeted or liked, mind you, but commented. It's uh, what you call being ratioed, where there are more comments than retweets or likes. The kids know what that is. They, don't, they say it's not good. But uh, reading through those responses, uh, the overwhelming sentiment uh, was the following. If the president speaks this way, then so must we. We need to ask ourselves, where does this escalation lead? What kind of example is set for our friends, our coworkers, and our children? As elected officials, how do we govern if we treat each other this way? Now, this fever of rancor and discord will ultimately break. That is my hope, and that is my belief. We will return to ourselves once more, and the sooner the better. In politics and in this interconnected world, we have to be willing to respect each other in an atmosphere of shared facts, shared values, and good faith. Abraham Lincoln put it best, and I'll close where I began with his plea. Quote, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory will swell again when touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Thank you for inviting me here today. It's been an honor to be with you. I look forward to your questions.